Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you all again this week. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't here, my, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm the youth director over at Community Bible Fellowship Church in Red Hill. Um, and I'm, I'm just I'm thrilled to be here again with you this week, to have the opportunity to preach, and especially just to be worshiping with brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. So thank you for your presence here and for your warm welcome. We're going to be in Luke 15 this morning, as you can see in your bulletins. It's on page 874 of the Pew Bible. We're picking up basically where we left off last week. We did the first 10 verses of, last, um, of Luke 15 last week, and we're going to finish the chapter today, beginning in verse 11. So as you turn to Luke 15, I'll tell you two quick stories. The first is the story of a man who lived for decades as an alcoholic. Um, his addiction tore his family apart, which just led to further um, abuse of alcohol and other substances, leaving him nearly broke and entirely alone. Until one day, for whatever reason, he picked up a Bible and he began to read God's word and he heard Jesus speaking to him through the words that he was reading and he came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and his life was dramatically changed. That's the first story. The second story is one of a man who was raised in the church. He was taught the Bible from a young age by his parents. He lived his whole life uh, committed to following its commands, faithfully attending church and he is um, serving now as a faithful follower of God in a church today. Now let me ask you, you don't have to answer out loud, but just your gut reaction, which one of these stories is more miraculous? Which one of them describes a more exciting or beautiful conversion? Both of these men were converted to a saving faith in Christ, and yet which one feels more um, glorious? If you're like me, your instinct might be to say the first one. It's a more powerful story. We, we see a bigger transformation, and I think that may be because a lot of us deep down feel like God's grace is only really displayed in big transformations, perhaps because we see his grace only as being needed for, for big-time sinners and not for people that always have known God and have diligently obeyed his word. The story that we're about to read, though, from Luke 15 will show us that obedient, command-keeping churchgoers are just as in need of God's grace as, as reckless, unholy lawbreakers are. And, and Jesus calls both of them to repentance and to discover something much more valuable than either of them is after. And so let's read together now from God's word and, and hear what he has to say to us this morning. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11, the word of God reads as follows. And he said, that's Jesus, said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is God's word. Will you pray with me now? Eternal God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has spoken by the Holy Spirit these words to us this morning, we pray that you will open each heart gathered here today to believe and receive this good news with joy, that we may each be filled with gladness by the goodness and beauty and truth of the gospel of your Son. Open our ears to the magnificent truths that you would have us to hear today. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen. As you may have picked up on, the two stories that I shared prior to the scripture reading are not so dissimilar from the two sides of the story that Jesus shares here with the story of the prodigal son, with these two sons. As a matter of fact, both of them are not all that dissimilar from many of us here today. And what I hope we'll come to see here in Luke 15 is that whether we see ourselves more in the younger brother or in the older brother, uh, more as r- the reckless evildoers or, or more as the pious rule followers, we are all deeply in need of God's grace. So l- let's dive in now as we explore this tale of two lost sons. And to do that, we're going to look at this story in the two major scenes that Jesus presents it in. Uh, scene one, the younger son, and scene two, the older son. So let's start off with the younger son. Look at verse 12 with me. The first thing we read about the younger son is that he said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. I know this might seem at first like like a normal son asking his dad for money, as sons have been known to do. What's going on here in this request is actually much more hateful and cruel. In the ancient world, much like today, inheritances were passed on from generation to generation um, at the time of the death of the owner of the estate. Um, in this case, being the father. And so because it was expected that the son would not receive his inheritance until his father's death, what this son is essentially doing is telling his father to his face that he wishes he was dead. He wants his father's things, not his father himself, and so he comes to his father and, and in essence says, why don't you just go ahead and die already? Clearly, this younger son is already lost. He hasn't left his father physically yet, but he's about as far from his father as he could be. He only wanted what his father could give him. He didn't care less. He couldn't care less about what his um, father uh, um, offered him in terms of fellowship with his father himself. So in a word, what the younger son expresses to his father here is hatred. He wanted his father dead. In fact, when Jesus says that the father divided his property, the word that he literally uses there means life. He divided his life as if he's tearing his life apart for his son giving up his life for his beloved child. And this would not have only been financially detrimental to his father and to his entire family, uh, the accumulated wealth of generations um, vanishing in moments, uh, but it would have also been rather humiliating. What this son did would have brought severe humiliation to his father. It would would have been known throughout the entire community in a small village like this, bringing significant disgrace and mockery to the family name, putting him and his whole family to shame. So this son's choice would have been financially devastating. It would have certainly been socially devastating. Uh, But more than that, uh, what cost the father most was no doubt the ruthless rejection of his own son, heartlessly renouncing his father, the one who gave him his very life. And the first thing that this son does when he has taken his father's money is he runs off to a far country, far away from home, far from his father. He leaves behind the the limitations of his family, the restrictions of his parents and community, getting far away from anything that can hold him accountable for his sins, so that he can sin freely with the freedom to indulge in all of his evil desires because he wants to live his own life with his own rules. He wants to be his own man, his own master, his own God. And it Isn't that the nature of sin in all of us, wanting to flee from God's presence so that we can live how we want to, uh, free from the restrictions of our Heavenly Father, so that we can be our own gods. And this is precisely what is depicted in the son running from his father to this far country. 
and what he does there is, is probably not very surprising. We don't know all the details exactly, but we know uh, that the younger son lives a wild and reckless life and, and wastes all of his money away. And he ends up having nothing, and he's miserable. And this, too, is exactly how sin works in our lives. It, it begins feeling liberating and exciting and, and fun, and it ends leaving us empty-handed with less than before, feeling more miserable than ever. So let me ask you this. Are you chasing that feeling? Are you running after that false sense of freedom that sin gives? Are you seeking to live your own life in your own way as your own God? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're not probably draining your parents' bank accounts and, and wasting their life savings on uh, strip clubs and casinos, but how many of us live by the same principles as the younger son, even if not to the same extremes? You know, you may not be splurging on, on strippers, but when you're the only one home and, and the only light on is the, the glow from your computer screen, maybe you're not so guiltless. Or maybe you're not emptying your wallet on slot machines at the casino, but, but maybe you have financial habits that still place yourself at the center of your financial world, whether that's expressed in wasteful spending and, and prodigality or in hoarding your money and, and resisting generosity because you love the security that comes from it. These things, they all can seem suitable for a time, even thrilling for a little while. But the picture of sin that Jesus paints for us here is one that I'm sure many of us can attest to, one where the excitement and fun of sin and security uh, lasts for a while before leaving us empty-handed and more miserable than before. In fact, Jesus describes how this son had literally nothing left and was selling himself out as a slave to farm pigs which was an especially detestable lifestyle to Jews, who not only refused to, to eat pigs, but often wouldn't go near them, um, wouldn't raise them, wouldn't touch them, would oftentimes even not even talk about them because they were such repulsive creatures to the Jews. And so to the Pharisees, being reduced to a homeless slave farming hogs in a Gentile nation was one of the most shameful and humiliating and disgusting things that a man could be. I mean, what could possibly be more repulsive and demeaning than feeding pigs? Perhaps one thing, because Jesus goes on to tell us that this man was so helplessly hungry that he longed even just to eat what the pigs were eating. He was so desperate that the thought of filling his stomach with pig slop didn't just cross his mind in passing, but it's actually what he was longing for. This is where chasing pleasure in sin left him, longing, craving hog mush to satisfy his desires. And at this point, when he had nothing, uh, when he realized that he had embarked on a journey that only led to uh, despair and self-destruction and ultimately to death, at this point he decided to turn to his father, the, the father that he had rejected and despised, treated like dirt, hoping that, that somehow he might be made just into a, a lowly servant in his father's house. And so he plans to confess to his father his sins uh, against his father and against God, not making excuses and, and blaming um, his father or his brother or his former master or the famine or God or anything like that, but acknowledging that he has deliberately sinned and recognizing his unworthiness to be called his father's son. And it's hard to say exactly what this younger son would have been thinking uh, or expecting in terms of his father's response, but we can take a pretty good guess at what the Pharisees were probably expecting um, since they knew the Jewish law and, and the tradition, so they knew Deuteronomy 21, which says immediately following the inheritance laws, uh, that if any father has a rebellious son, a glutton or a drunkard, that he shall be taken before the elders of the city and the men of the village shall gather together and stone him to death. So whatever the son was hoping for, it, it certainly would not have been unexpected in this time for the father to have him killed, or at least to give him a severe beating. And, and yet what happens? Look at verse 20 with me. He arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. There's no anger in the father's heart. It's only joy, only compassion. And so the son begins to pour out his confession like he practiced all along the way and to, and to make his request. But before he can even finish, the father interrupts him excitedly and he calls to his servants saying, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. From before the son was even back 
Uh, the father was waiting for him, his eyes scanning the horizon, looking for his child in, in eager anticipation. And when he saw him, he ran. He ran to him. It's uncommon even today to see older men running. Uh, but in the ancient world, it was even more unusual. It was actually really uh, an undignified thing to do for an older man in his position to run. And so he probably hadn't run to greet anyone in decades. Traditional, distinguished patriarchs like him simply didn't do it. It was undignifying. And so to gather up his robes like some boy and expose his legs and sprint off to greet his son would have been quite the sight to see. So understand that when the father runs to meet his son here, he is deliberately setting himself up for public disgrace, willingly making a fool out of himself for all to see. But he does so joyfully almost like he can't control it, rushing to his son to embrace him, to throw himself upon him, kissing him and welcoming him home. This is the love that Christ has for lost sinners like you and me. A love that doesn't wait for us to come to him, that doesn't wait for us to come and confess or repent or offer anything of ourselves, but that rushes towards us and wraps its arms around us as disgusting and, and sinful and, and pigsty reeking as we still are. And maybe you're here today and you know that the life that you're living is wrong and reckless and self-destructive and maybe that has hindered you from feeling ready to come to Jesus and if that's you let me point you to Jesus as he reveals himself to be in this story as a loving father who doesn't speak a single word of condemnation against those who come to him but runs toward them in excitement and embraces them joyfully so if there's still something that terrifies you about coming to Jesus, know that there is nothing that would fill him with more joy. This is what Jesus is showing us about himself in describing the father's reaction to his son coming home in this way. And though it was customary for someone in a situation like the son's to come bearing gifts, to have any hope of reconciliation with someone that they had wronged, what we see instead is not only his shamefulness in not having anything to give to his father, but we see the overwhelming generosity that the father has for his son, who he, he lavishes abundance of, of gifts upon, unsparingly upon his son. It's as if he calls to his servants and says, spare no expense, you know, burn the budget, we're going to have a party, get him the best robe, the best shoes, and the nicest ring. No one had ever given the son anything when he was out in his far country, not even pig slop, and now... He is receiving an abundance of glorious gifts from the one that he had just despised and rejected. And there's no explanation needed. Uh, the father doesn't wait for him to beg or plead. He doesn't wait for him um, to, to make things right, to repent, or, or promise to do better, to pay off his debts. In fact, the father completely ignores any attempt that the son might have uh, of working his way back to sonship or of earning his father's favor. He doesn't even let him finish his request because the father's love is not conditioned by uh, confession or repentance or good works of any sort. It is unconditional. And so he welcomes his son immediately. There's no hesitancy, no anger, no frustration, only joy. And in joy, the father celebrates, uh, calling others to celebrate with him. Rather than killing his son, he kills the fattened calf, which was a, a delicacy for the, the rarest of occasions at this time, uh, one that would have taken dozens to eat, maybe even over a hundred people to eat this, indicating that this is probably a, a whole village event where the whole community is being invited to gather together to rejoice over this son coming home. This isn't some little welcome back, get together, or a casual dinner. This is a, a full-blown feast, an enormous celebration for a very undeserving son. And Jesus tells this story to show the Pharisees and to show us today, thousands of years later, the love that he has for lost sinners and the joy that it brings him to see them come to him. It can be easy for us to think of God as being hesitant to receive us, as though he's still frustrated with us or disappointed in us. But Jesus shows us here that there's no rebuke, no anger, no reluctance, only joy. He doesn't care that you have nothing to offer. In fact, that's what he wants. He wants you to come empty-handed, still reeking of the pig pen, and come be restored to him as a son, as a daughter, to come into his home so that he can lavish blessings upon you. Though we are infinitely indebted to him, it fills him with joy to embrace us and to shower us with blessings. So that's scene one. That's the younger son. 
And if you're like me, you may have grown up only ever hearing that part of the story. But as beautiful and as powerful as it is, the story doesn't end there. In fact, in scene two, the, the older brother comes on the scene, uh, and the story takes a pretty unfortunate turn, uh, where we actually get to the main point of what Jesus uh, is getting us toward. We reach the climax of the parable that Jesus has been building up to. So this whole story, it begins with Jesus telling us that there was a father with two sons, the older of which uh, has kind of remained silent in the background up until this point. But then this older son pops onto the scene and he takes center stage for the rest of the act. Out in the field, he, he's asking what the celebration is about, to which one of the, the servants responds in verse 27, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Now notice that the servant correctly identifies uh, two main reasons for the celebration, the son's return and the father's reception of him. Both the son coming back to the father and the father receiving him back, welcoming him as his son, as his child, are cause for rejoicing. And yet, rather than filling this older son with joy, it, it actually makes him angry. He's angry about both of these things. He, he's angry that his brother is back, and he's especially angry that his father has welcomed him and received him. And so he, he refuses to participate in the celebration. And so his father comes out to implore him to come inside, to come join the party. And he does this yet again at the cost of his own name being shamed. A man hosting a feast and then and leaving in the middle of this, uh, leaving his guests there alone, this would have been appalling to ancient Jews. And yet the father deliberately exposes himself to this public humiliation, once again, for the sake of his son, out of an incredible love for this wayward child. And interestingly, this is the second time now that we see in the parable uh, where the father exits his home, uh, goes into his field and approaches his son, encouraging him to come in to a celebration, uh, not waiting for the son to come home, but seeking himself, seeking him out in the field. Uh, but this time it's the older son, not the younger. And it, uh, instead of not seeing himself as worthy, the son actually sees himself as worthy of much more. So the older son answers the father in verse 29. And he says, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. I can remember reading those words. I think I was in middle school for the first time when I read that, and thinking to myself, like, Jesus, are you really going to condemn this guy? Like, he has a point, doesn't he? He had faithfully served his father his entire life, uh, while his brother ran off spending his dad's living on on alcohol and, and prostitutes and wasting his family's money away, and then he comes back to have more money wasted on him, on celebrating him nonetheless? And you want the older brother just to be fine with that? I think it's an understandable frustration for many of us. But think about the older brother's words in relation to the context of the chapter that we're in. The chapter begins with the Pharisees grumbling that Jesus receives sinners and he eats with them. And then Jesus responds with this parable. You see the connection he's making. The objection that the Pharisees made to Jesus is the exact same objection that this older son is making to his father. This man receives sinners and eats with them. This father of mine welcomes selfish, dirty delinquents, and he celebrates with them. He welcomes them into his home to enjoy a feast with him. The older brother explains then that his view of, of this injustice by citing his own good works to kind of call out the father's unfairness. He points to his own good works in serving his father, revealing that his issue is not so much that he's bad and disobedient like his younger brother, but that he's good and obedient, and that he sees this as determining his worth and, and earning his father's love. But this older son doesn't have any genuine love for his father, and he fails to see and to accept his father's unconditional love for him, trying to work for it instead. Like his brother, the older son merely wants his father's things. He only wants what his father can give him and not his father himself. Though the younger son went far away with his father's things, the older son stayed close and he obeyed his father as a means of getting control and receiving his father's blessings. They have different strategies, but the same goal. They use their father in different ways to get the same thing that each of them are longing for. Not his love, but his stuff. Not fellowship with his father, but what the father can give them. 
the NIV nicely captures what the older son says in verse 29. It says, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. And slaving is a good translation of the word that is used here. And it highlights how this son was viewing his relationship with his father, who was not father to him, but master. And he was not son, but slave. The older brother reveals in his objection that his father's happiness was never his real aim. He never desired to simply please his father, much less enjoy fellowship with his father. He wanted to maybe enjoy a goat with his friend, but when it comes to enjoying fellowship with his father, not even the fattened calf would bring him inside. What he wanted was to use his obedience to get things from his father that he thought he could merit with his own good behavior. And in this attitude, we can see what Jesus is showing to the Pharisees. About the Pharisees, and about us as well, if we're willing to admit it. The Pharisees, they viewed themselves as the model sons who, who always obeyed their father's commands, never um, doing anything that they weren't told to, but slaving away constantly in order to merit his favor. And yet, in working to earn things from God with their obedience, they never embraced his love for them as sons. They never formed real relationships with him as their father. They never enjoyed fellowship with him for its own sake. They were, they were estranged from God. They were far, as far away from God as the younger brother was, even though they were right across from him. And they, the Pharisees, like the older brother, professed obedience to God while actively disobeying his most important command to come inside empty-handed and enjoy fellowship with him. And what Jesus shows the Pharisees is through the older brother and shows us as well here this morning is really pretty concerning. Namely that careful obedience to God's commands can actually serve as a strategy for rebelling against God. A rebellion against God is not always outward and obvious. It can look like immorality or it can look like morality. You can rebel against God by wasting all of your money at a casino, sure. Or you can rebel against God by giving all of your money to the poor. You can rebel against God by walking in here to this building every week or, or reading your Bible every day. You can be estranged from God, your Heavenly Father, either by breaking His laws or by diligently keeping all of them. Both unrighteousness and self-righteousness can alienate you from the Father. And so what Jesus is showing is that when He comes to seek us out, He's, he's coming to save us, not just from our bad works, but our good works as well. Not just our unrighteousness, but even, and perhaps especially, our self-righteousness. As one man said, Jesus not only saves us from the bad things we do, he also saves us from the reasons we ever did anything right. The Father then gives the last words in this parable, once again, gently and graciously, imploring his son to come to him. He doesn't rebuke him uh, or lash out in anger, but he warmly and tenderly pleads with him to come inside, to join the, the celebration, and to enjoy fellowship with himself. And then the story ends. And Jesus ends the story right there, with the father entreating his son to join the celebration, and then we don't hear anything else. It leaves the Pharisees on a cliffhanger with an unfinished parable, leaving us all wondering, what will he do? Will he go inside? And in doing so, we naturally ask ourselves, well, what should he do? How should this story end? And by extension, what would we do? Or even, what will we do? How will we respond to this father imploring his son to come join the celebration? Will we continue living like the Pharisees? Like the, the older brother? Or will we swallow our pride and, and recognize that nothing that we bring to the table can merit the father's love? That what the father wants from us uh, is not to earn his affection, but simply to receive it freely. That our greatest joy in this life is not slavishly obeying some master, but delightfully enjoying fellowship with our Father. So Jesus concludes this unfinished parable in a way that demands a response from the Pharisees and as well as us, whether we are the younger son or, or the older son. So respond. If you are a lost younger son this morning who doesn't know Jesus, who's living recklessly in sin, pursuing immoral desires, then you have no reason to fear that you are too far gone. You, you have nothing uh, uh, to, to hesitate about it, as though God might not accept you 
or, or welcome you. There's no reason to be concerned or to think that you have anything to bring or to do first before you come to God. All that is needed is that you come empty-handed to God and he will run to you and embrace you and joyfully welcome you into his home to, to enjoy fellowship with him forever. So come to Jesus this morning and receive his compassionate love. And if you're a lost older son as well, uh, passionate about obedience, a law follower, a rule keeper, uh, then hear this. Your rule keeping doesn't make you any less lost than the rebellious younger son. Your diligent commitment to moral living doesn't make you any less alienated from the father than, than the reckless, immoral lawbreaker. So lay aside your futile efforts at perfection, hand over your self-righteousness, and receive righteousness himself. And, and he will bless you with a joy far greater than anything your goodness can produce. So whether you are the younger brother or, or the older one, whether you are rebelling against God by doing what you want to do, or by following every rule, the solution to your situation is the same. Give up. Come to Jesus empty-handed, and he will welcome you joyfully to come to his home to delight in the marvelous joys of fellowship with himself, both now and forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a comfort it is to be welcomed by you with such compassion, as wicked and messed up as we are. And what a joy it is to know that you not only receive sinners, but that you receive Pharisees such as us. May we cherish these truths today and always, that your incomprehensible love may be magnified in our hearts. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for his glory. Amen.